From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Arizona Department of Education Superintendent Diane Douglas held her State of Education, which educational issues she plans to tackle this year. DACA students fear the future of their education now that President Trump is in office. How university presidents are working to secure students' futures. Plus, how Navajo leaders are feeling about the new administration and what expectations they have for the next four years. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Katie Beery. And I'm Tyler Paley. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. The state of Arizona's education is at a crossroads. That's what Superintendent of Public Instruction Diane Douglas told the House Education Committee during her State of Education speech. Cronkite News reporter Cassidy McDonald tells us what's on her agenda for the new year there still remains an immense amount of work to be done. Superintendent Diane Douglas says that this work also includes supporting Arizona's teachers. Too many of our teachers work multiple jobs. They leave the state or they leave the profession entirely trying to make ends meet for their family. Douglas outlined a $140 million pay raise plan, a 5% increase for all classroom teachers. This money would be an important first step in our efforts to retain current teachers and attract new teachers to our profession. This year's Teacher of the Year, Michelle Doherty, feels teacher investment should be top priority. I invest in my class, I invest in myself as a teacher, and I would like for the state to invest in us as well. Doherty says this also means investing in lower income children with additional dual language learning programs that helps advance different ways of thinking. It has been extremely successful um, to have students come back to visit me and they're speaking in Spanish or translating for another teacher. It's pretty incredible. Douglas also raised concerns that the IT budget was left completely out of the governor's initial budget, which would make it nearly impossible for students to have secure data. No maintenance or development funding for a system that processes five billion, that's billion with a B, in state funds would make it impossible to pay our schools and maintain secure student data. In Phoenix, Cassidy McDonald, Cronkite News. Don Wallace, the senior advisor to the governor for education and strategic initiatives, says that there is an intent to change the zero dollar budget figure after further review of the budget development process. It's school choice week across the country. Tonight, we're looking at an alternative to buses and classrooms. Cronkite News reporter McKenna Dalgarno talked to one homeschooling family who shows us their typical day. I really like that flower patch. There are more than 14,000 homeschooled students in Maricopa County, and the Green family makes up three of them. <laughs> it was not something that I envisioned myself doing. Becky Green, mother of five, started homeschooling six years ago. She currently teaches her three school-aged children and says every day looks different. I try to have a base, basic schedule of things that I want us to touch on, but I have a baby and sometimes she has a poopy diaper. Green and her husband decided to homeschool after recognizing that they wanted to be responsible for their children's education. Because I know my kids, I can really customize our curriculum to how my children learn best. Green teams up with other homeschooling families and says it's a chance for the kids to come together in a classroom setting. Last semester we did astronomy and that's going to be our science. Anna Valetic, the homeschool liaison for Maricopa County Education Services, says these co-op resources are key for helping families. Knowing what to teach and how to teach it. And once they find that, it, it just it helps. When a family decides they want to homeschool, they first must fill out one of these, an affidavit of intent to homeschool. And along with that, I need to to see the original birth certificate of the child. Letic says it's a very simple and quick process and there are no other requirements. I'm not a trained teacher and I thought that that was something we had to do. Green says it's not always easy, but it's definitely worth it. There are days where I want to just stick them on the school bus and say, see ya. But um, I realized that for our family, this is the right thing to do. In Mesa, McKenna Delgarno, Cronkite News. If you're a family who homeschools, there will be an environmental education exploration program in Chandler on February 9th. For more information, head over to cronkitenews.azpbs.org under the Education tab. Phoenix Chamber of Commerce hosted a Valley Voices event this morning, shining light on how the role of higher education is for Arizona's economy. 
Arizona State University President Dr. Michael Crow, along with Maricopa County Community College Chancellor Dr. Maria Harper Marinek, spoke on the importance of maintaining higher education and high school graduates for the Arizona economy. Harper Marinek says they must go hand in hand for the state to progress. The businesses alone are not going to solve all the problems, that we have to come together for dialogue to understand how we move the economy of the state forward together in partnership. Harper Marinek says that over 50% of the students at Maricopa County Community Colleges do come in with plans of transferring to a state university to continue, continue their higher education. Students at Arizona universities who qualified for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, are now living in limbo. Many fear President Trump will overturn the executive action that protects them from deportation. Reporter Adriana D'Alba explains what's at stake. People who have DACA would lose access to work permits, driver's licenses, even in state tuition, and could be deported from the country they call home. It's been a long road for Elizabeth Perez, a justice studies major at ASU and the first in her family to attend college. She's a DACA recipient who worked years cleaning houses in order to afford tuition. And I became the first dreamer to work at the city of Phoenix because of my deferred action. And I left my house in a blazer and my mom was so proud of me. She also worked on mobilizing voters during the last election when Donald Trump promised to put an end to DACA. But if DACA gets repealed, I honestly don't know what will happen. Elizabeth is one of more than 740,000 DACA recipients in the U.S. At least 30,000 live in Arizona alone, and many are students. We have a strong uh, desire at every level of the institution to be as helpful as we can to uh, create an, an environment where these students can have access to everything that the university has, has to offer. ASU President Crow and other university presidents around the country are backing DACA students. And so are professors. Nearly 1,300 professors from universities in Arizona and community colleges have signed this letter in support of DACA students. One of their requests is continuing to offer them in-state tuition. Despite the fear of deportation, the Arizona Dream Act Coalition reports an increase in DACA applications since Trump was elected president. My advice to those students who have DACA right now is to renew. As for but as the spirit of this country has taught her not to give up. Because I know how lucky I am to be in this country. And she's still looking to the future. After she graduates in May, Perez plans to go to law school. Perez actually didn't know she was undocumented until her parents told her in high school. Often these DACA students don't find out until they're ready to apply for that first job or go to college. In the Broadcast Center, Adriana de Alba, Cronkite News. School officials at Boulder Creek High School in Anthem are under fire for performing a skit that parodied President Trump. The video featured the principal as Kellyanne Conway and the athletic director as Trump. They made jokes at the expense of students and parents. We're here to make Boulder Creek great again. We're going to drain the jungle and make Boulder Creek great again. We will build the wall around our border and keep those moron parents and weak and loser students out. The video was produced for a faculty meeting, but was uploaded to Facebook this weekend. The principal and athletic director are now on administrative leave and sent a letter apologizing to parents. President Donald Trump says that millions of people voted illegally. White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer says that Trump's claims are based on studies and evidence, but he did not provide any evidence during today's press briefing. I think he stated his concerns, uh, voter fraud and, and people voting illegally during the campaign. And he continues to maintain that belief based on studies and evidence that people have presented to him. No evidence or studies to, prov uh, to prove Spicer and Trump's claims. Trump also signed multiple executive orders today, including one that will advance the construction of the Keystone XL and Dakota Access pipelines. And Trump's cabinet is filling up as more nominees have been confirmed. Ben Carson has received committee approval for the Department of Housing and Urban Development. The entire Senate must approve the nominees before the confirmation is complete. The election of Donald Trump left many people unsure of what the future would hold. Cronkite News reporter Anthony Marroquin took a look at the expectations Navajo leaders have for the incoming administration. For Native Americans, like everyone else around the country, political ideologies vary from tribe to tribe. 
But one thing both sides can agree on, it's time to work together. The Navajo code word for hand grenade was no mercy. Peter McDonald Sr. knows a language that most people will never hear. No mercy in Navajo means potato. Oh, okay. Because yeah. hand grenade looks like a potato. McDonald was a Navajo code talker with the Marine Corps during World War II. In those days, he was stationed in the Pacific Theater to help defeat the Japanese. But today, his fight is at home. Navajo tribe, like most Indian tribes, we're all very conservative. McDonald is a strong supporter of President Donald Trump, but that hasn't been the most popular opinion among the Navajo. So as I've always said, that, uh, that we, whoever is elected, we as Navajo Nation will work with whomever. Navajo Nation President Russell Begay said he felt Hillary Clinton really connected with the common person and would advocate for Navajo on all level of government. But he added that his nation was flexible and would work with the Trump administration. And we felt that, uh, that he was not really connecting uh, with who we are as a nation. But in McDonald's eyes, there's nothing to worry about. Having a Republican in the White House is enough to start celebrating. in Navajo means do it yourself to, to be what you want to be. And that's this Republican philosophy. BK told us he's especially excited about the president's plan to bring companies back to the U.S. because he says that Navajo taxes and regulations are comparable to those with Mexico and other countries. In Washington, D.C., Anthony Marroquin, Cronkite News. Homelessness in the valley is a prevalent issue, but officials find it difficult to understand the full scope of the problem. Coming up on Cronkite News, how local agencies are coming together to get an accurate count of Arizona's homeless. Plus, how generations of Arizona women are fighting for their rights and the message they want to leave for young women. We see them struggling on the streets, people struggling with homelessness. Today, agencies from all over Maricopa County got together to get an accurate count of those living on the streets. Cronkite News reporter Trevor Fay went along to see the process and how workers try to help the homeless. Community Bridges Incorporated took us along this morning on their annual homeless count in Maricopa County. After getting clean, I ended up coming into a field where I thought I could help people. I got hired with, with uh, CBI and then I've been here now for going on eight years. Howard drove from location to location looking for those who appeared to be homeless. Um, to do a survey on them to find out what kind of services they are in need of and how we can better accommodate them. We met a woman named Betty Jean Ryder who came back to the valley to help her disabled sister. We have no family and um, it was either hot, I go on the street or she does and she's disabled. Ryder has tried to get in touch with her sister, but hasn't seen her in a week. She spoke to police, but they were unable to update Ryder on her sister's situation. All I wanted to do is just go over there and kick open the door to make sure she's okay, because she's all I have left. Homeless people don't always look like you'd expect them to. We met a well-dressed man named Stephen Irvin by the light rail, who told us he's been homeless for about a year and a half. There's shelters and things like that, but uh, most of these shelters, man, are, are, are de de the conditions are deplorable that most people would rather sleep on the streets. Irvin travels with an electric keyboard, which he plays to earn some money on the side. <laughs> Those donations aren't enough to live on. The annual homeless count helps local governments and nonprofit organizations determine the resources needed to help those on the streets. In Phoenix, Trevor Fay, Cronkite News. 
There's additional help for those on the street. The downtown Phoenix ambassadors have teamed up with Community Bridges to do outreach to the homeless downtown. And the Women's March in Phoenix and across the country brought together women of all ages. I met a group from Sun City who has spent decades fighting for their rights, and they hope younger women will appreciate their sacrifice. 50 Sun City women and a few supportive husbands gathered in a crowded parking lot on a cold January morning. We're getting ready to march for women's rights and human rights. They boarded a bus bound for the Capitol. All over this land, I sing it in the morning. The majority are retired, but still active politically. On the way, signs of progress, including a street named after the first female governor of Arizona. At the march, the Sun City women joined a crowd of 20,000. It's a very enthusiastic, gung-ho group of women who make me really proud to be getting older. What do you think about all the different generations of women out here? Isn't that exciting? That was not the kind of job that women could have at that time. Once home, they reflected on how far they've come <laughs> and fears about the clock being turned back. And I am very, very concerned about abortion rights. Memories of a time when abortion was not legal. She just killed herself. Oh. So again, she was lost and a baby was lost. And women were denied the same career opportunities as men. I switched to something that I thought would be an acceptable uh, a career for a woman. They would assume I was there to get them coffee. He says, sure, sure, surely, baby. Above all, a warning for the next generation. We just need to keep and cherish our rights, and we need to understand that it, they weren't received that long ago. Many of these women say that their children and grandchildren cannot fathom the barriers they faced. One woman told me she was not able to take out a car loan without her husband or father's permission. It's flu season and the number of cases is on the rise. Coming up on Cronkite News, what steps you can take to make sure you don't get sick this flu season. Schools across Flagstaff were closed today. Will we see more snow tomorrow? I have that answer coming up. You're a dreamer Don't hide it from anyone Don't hide it from anyone Hey, would you believe me if I said We are here for the reason now This is our life, this is what counts This is for us, I will go Well, the flu is on the rise in Arizona. Reporter Janie Hoyt breaks down the numbers and tells us how to keep yourself healthy this season. Last year, Arizona had a banner year for flu. You may think with our warmer temperatures, we'd have less flu cases than other parts of the country, but that's not the case. We had more cases in Arizona than most of the country saw last year. Um, so in that sense, Arizona had the worst flu season than the rest of the country last year. And we're on track to have another, quote, banner year for flu. According to data from the Arizona Department of Health Services, the current season total is about 300 cases higher than last season's numbers recorded around this time last year. Flu is a really, really unpredictable virus, and every year the flu behaves a little bit differently. There are several ways to prevent yourself from getting the flu this year. The Arizona Department of Health Services does recommend getting your flu shot every year to avoid getting sick. They also recommend to wipe down any surfaces that may be contaminated, wash your hands frequently, and if you do end up getting the flu this year, to stay home to avoid getting anyone else sick. 
Emergency physician John McGreevy says it's not too late to get your vaccination. Um, and even though we've already started seeing the flu this year, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't get vaccinated as we'll continue to see the flu now for the next several months. According to the Arizona Emergency Information Network, Arizona's flu season typically lasts from October until May, so it's important to keep yourself healthy year-round. In Phoenix, Janie Hoyt, Cronkite News. And we want to know if you've had a flu shot this season. Let us know by voting in our Twitter poll at Cronkite News. So far, 41% of people have had a flu shot. 52%, a little more than half, are thinking about getting the flu shot. Northern Arizona has seen around three feet of snow in the last six days, according to the National Weather Service. This was the 12th greatest amount of snow for a six-day storm in Flagstaff history. More snowstorms could be in the forecast, as well as cooler temperatures. How will that affect us here in the Valley? Allison Gargaro has your forecast. We have a live look here in Flagstaff. We can see some snow on the ground and clouds up above. But as we look into what was going on today, we see up in the high country there were some scattered snowstorms. But right down in Phoenix, we were nice and dry. Currently, we're looking and it is 26 degrees in Flagstaff, 20s over in Sholo, and 56 here in Phoenix. As we take a look into the future, we do see Again, some snow showers up in the high country, but as we take a look into your day tomorrow and drive home, sunny all across Arizona. And those public schools in Flagstaff will be closed tomorrow as well. And as we take a look into your seven day forecast, we do see cooler temperatures than normal. It won't hit above 60 degrees. But as we take a look into the rest of your week, we see a nice sunny and 67 degrees Sunday. And those, that sunshine will continue throughout the rest of your week. Allison Gargaro, Cronkite Weather. We Arizonans enjoy Uber and Lyft to get around and even Postmates when we're hungry. But Jolani Martinez explains the newest delivery app that's fueling the need of commuters in Southern California, which may be headed our way. As a part-time Uber and Lyft driver, Rudy Espinoza was caught a bit off guard by his next job offer. Uh, when I was asked to come on board and they explained to me the concept of what they had going, I, I found it kind of um, like unusual. Like, well, who would want to get gas? It began in 2015 when CEO Bruno Hazan was looking for a way to reduce the time Angelino spent behind the wheel. I, I started really purple that way, uh, uh, how we can like uh, help saving time for, for, for consumers. In a city legendary for its traffic, an app for a gas delivery seemed like a smart road to take for the tech entrepreneur. Requesting a gas refuel is as easy as registering your car, location, selecting the type of fuel you want, and how soon you need it. Time to pump. You must also keep your gas tank open in case carriers can't access it from the outside. Espinoza likes how the job can be done without bothering the customer. I just don't want them to know that I came and filled up their car. I just want them to turn it on and see it full and say, wow, you know, that's great. While convenient, for some, it's just not worth the service charge, which ranges from $3.99 to $5.99, depending on how quickly you need to fuel up. Yeah, if somebody comes to your car and puts gas in your car, you should pay him for that service. But it's not something that I would do, necessarily. The company hopes to expand soon, and Espinoza suspects Arizona will be on the list. But I think Phoenix would be a big city area where people come into work and they forget to put gas. And that's usually what happens. People come in, forget to put gas in their car and say, darn it, and now I gotta go get gas. So instead of pulling into the station, simply pull out your phone for a price. In Los Angeles, Jolani Martinez, Cronkite News. A new exhibit in Chandler is highlighting the lives of Japanese Americans who were forced into internment camps. Coming up on Cronkite News, how America's pastime helped internees find hope in hard times. I wasn't so beloved.
for the history books. Enjoy. Chandler has a new exhibit at Nozomi Park that highlights the life of Japanese Americans forced into internment camps in Arizona during World War II. Allison Gargaro takes us to a former teenage internee who used a game to find a glimmer of hope. Kenzo Zenimara was just 15 when his family was taken to the Gila River Relocation Center an internment camp for Japanese Americans during World War II. Still, he turned America's favorite pastime, baseball, into his own. My dad always uh, was a baseball nut. Soon as we got into camp, he started looking to uh, build a baseball park. Two major internment camps in Arizona, Poston and Gila River, held more than 30,000 Japanese Americans. Uh, these are individuals who had their property taken, um, their rights taken away, and incarcerated just because they looked like the enemy, they weren't the enemy. Under harsh circumstances, several camp internees kept one ideal in mind. Living with grace despite the unimaginable. Baseball was a way to keep spirits alive inside the barbed wire fence. Surprisingly, when we played the first game, the camp director came out to throw out the first pitch. Zenimara, after he left the camp, kept baseball a big part of his life, teaching teens the game until he finally retired 15 years ago. In Phoenix, Allison Gargaro, Cronkite News. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.